solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that both witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, in order to save time, we ask that the entire uh, opening statements of both witnesses be placed in the record without object objection so, uh, so moved. Uh, we now will uh, allow you to abbreviate, uh, since your entire opening statement is in the record, try to stay within the five minutes. Ms. Evans. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee. I am pleased to be invited back to share my views of Obamacare implementation, the rollout of HealthCare.gov. From an IT implementation standpoint, HealthCare.gov was a classic IT project failure that happens in the Federal Government too frequently. As the executive leadership of the Federal departments and agencies, the President's political appointees are at the top of the management chain for Federal employees and contractors. In looking for the cause of this failure, some point to the lack of testing, others, including the President, cite the challenges of the IT procurement process, and still others note the complexity of the program and the interfaces with private insurance company systems. However, the cause of this failure was not the complexity of the program, nor the procurement process, nor the testing. The functionality and the shortcomings of healthcare.gov are a result of bad management decisions made by policy officials within the administration. They did this to themselves. And if they are now surprised, it is because their own policy officials failed to inform them of the decisions that they have made and the consequences associated with those decisions. As soon as this legislation was passed, there were policy decisions which needed to be made. These policy decisions would drive the technical design of healthcare.gov IT system. They fundamentally determined the workflow and business processes driving how the law would be implemented. I have been on both sides of policy implementation, as a career civil servant and as a political appointee. The problems with healthcare.gov are symptomatic of a recurring problem. Passing a law or issuing a policy is not enough. If there is a new law, management reform, or policy initiative you want to accomplish, then you as a policy official need to be engaged during the implementation to assure there is an appropriate integrated project team in place to manage the day-to-day -day operations. All levels of the organization need to be willing to get into the weeds to understand these intricate aspects of management and implementation because the devil is in the details. Someone can change a seemingly innocuous requirement in a meeting and cause a huge impact on schedule, cost, or functionality. IT projects are particularly good at highlighting management failings because they require coordination between the many different parts of an organization. If the agency's CIO is not actively at the management table, participating in those decisions, and more importantly, explaining the ramifications of the policy decisions they are making, then projects get off track and ultimately fail. The Chief Information Officer is the person in the C-suite who has the capacity to translate technology issues into business speak for other business leaders. When a technical implementation specification hinges on a policy decision, the technical team depends upon the CIO to elevate the question to the appropriate decision maker. Because the CIO can speak to senior executives in terms that are relevant to them and can state potential consequences in terms of political and policy values, the CIO is in a unique position to ensure that policy officials do not regard those decisions as staff level functions. And if these potential consequences are significant, then departmental and White House officials may need to be briefed by the CIOs. In the wake of the healthcare.gov implementation failure, some analysts have asserted that the private sector could have done this better, thereby implying that there are some conditions inherent in Federal IT which impedes success and impairs Federal CIOs. It is certainly true that Federal CIOs are burdened by deliberative restraints placed upon them by Congress and OMB. But Federal CIOs also enjoy freedom from competition and the whims of the market. Overall, Federal CIOs and commercial CIOs are more similar than different. And we all have the same job description, to be the technical, savvy member of the executive team, to provide value through innovation, to manage data as a strategic asset, and to lead a large team of technologists and inspire them to achieve greatness. 
Whether a CIO is at a large or small organization, bureau level or department, public sector or private, the scale may differ, but the management challenges are the same. I have included in my written statement some key questions which every CIO should be asking, but more importantly, the CIO should be able to answer these questions for their leadership in clear business terms. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Mr. Spires. Uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on issues with healthcare.gov and more generally on IT management issues in the Federal Government. With more than 30 years of experience working on delivery of large IT programs, I speak from real world experience regarding what is required to successfully deliver such programs. I served in the past two administrations and saw similar IT management issues in both, so my remarks focus on highlighting systemic weaknesses in our ability to effectively manage IT along with some recommended solutions. My written testimony outlines five key elements required to effectively deliver an IT program. In regards to the rollout of healthcare.gov, my information was obtained from previous congressional hearings on media articles, yet it is clear that there were fundamental weaknesses in the program management processes. For a system as complex as healthcare.gov, best practice would have led to a plan that included completion and testing of all subsystems six months prior to public launch, three months of end-to-end -end functional integration testing, and a subsequent three-month pilot phase in which selected groups of users identify problems not caught in testing. It was reported the program did not start end-to-end -end functional testing until two weeks prior to launch, and there was no formal pilot program prior to rollout. This is evidence of a lack of mature program management processes. Second, there was a lack of program governance model that recognizes the proper roles and authorities of the important stakeholders to include the business, IT, procurement, privacy, et cetera. For IT programs, the business organization or mission organization must be intimately involved in helping define requirements, making hard functionality trade-offs, and being a champion for the program. The IT organization must ensure there is a capable program management office using management best practices to deliver large IT programs. Evidence on the launch of healthcare.gov shows the balance between the business and IT organizations was not correct. For example, changes were being finalized up to a few weeks before launch. This is much too late. Requirements should have been locked down months before. The business organization had the ability to make changes that led to bad management practice. The issues of the rollout of healthcare.gov are emblematic of the IT management challenges in the Federal Government. Yet improving our ability to effectively manage IT is critical. Our government, if it more effectively manages IT, can harness its transformational capability, significantly improving government's effectiveness and efficiency. I recommend that three actions be taken to improve Federal Government IT. First, it is important that Congress pass legislation to update how this government manages IT. I appreciate the leadership of Chairman Issa and Representative Connolly in co-sponsoring the FATARA legislation. While legislation alone will not fix all issues with IT management, it will elevate the standing of agency CIOs and put in place mechanisms for development of centers of excellence to leverage best practices in program management and acquisition across the Federal Government. These changes could have helped to address the critical failings of the program management of healthcare.gov. Second, Agency CIOs need to have control over implementation, operations, and the budget of all commodity IT in their agency, which includes the data centers, cloud services, servers, networks, standard collaboration tools like email, as well as back office administrative systems. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate to be in a session that included a number of CIOs for Fortune 50 companies. In the course of the discussion, it became clear that one of the key elements in effectively leveraging IT for an enterprise is a modernization, standardization, and appropriate consolidation of the underlying IT infrastructure. I urge both Congress to address this recommendation through the IT reform legislation and the administration to address this recommendation through the portfolio stat process. Third, the current administration should make IT management a centerpiece of its overall management reform agenda. This entails the recognition and focus at the most senior levels of government of the importance of IT and improving IT management includes a serious commitment to improving program management practices, elevating the status of agency CIOs, and ensuring the agency CIOs own the commodity IT. 
I hope the troubled launch of healthcare.gov can serve as a catalyst to drive positive change in the way we manage IT. The best practices exist and are proven. We need leadership in Congress to pass the reform legislation and leadership in the administration to recognize the importance of IT management. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, first of all, I will ask unanimous consent that the article entitled The Healthcare.gov Rollout, uh, What Should We Learn, which our, Mr. Spires uh, authored on November 4, 2013, be placed in the record without objection, so ordered. Uh, I am going to start with you, Mr. Spires. You heard the first panel. From your experience, and I will go to Ms. Evans also, did I have the right people for the most part here, leaving GAO out for a moment, to ask who is responsible, why was this thing launched, practically non-working completely, only six successes, uh, successful registration in the first day? Did I have the right people, or did I have the wrong people, and that is why they all said it wasn't their job? <laughs> um, you had the right technical people at the table. Um, I believe in a balanced program where you have technology leaders as well as the business leaders working together. But somebody at the table should have been able to tell us basically who should have stopped this program or recognized that it was going to fail to launch. Somebody at that table, I think, should have been able to tell you that. Ms. Evans, in your time at OMB, I think more than anything else, is it your experience that the Office of Management and Budget ultimately the OMB director is who gets to meet with the President, who gets to say that key pieces of legislation, key implementations are or are not going correctly? Has that your, been your experience? And I will speak from my experience, and that, that is true. And so we viewed when, during my tenure that OMB had oversight into the executive branch of um, ensuring that the President's priorities got implemented. Now, I am going to ask you from one personal experience. Have you been in the Oval, other than ceremonially, have you been in the Oval for a meeting? Uh, not exactly in the Oval Office, but they have staff offices right. outside. But you were, you were in the, yes. that area. Yes. So you were there, I assume, with the Director or somebody on some important briefing that was going on? Yes. And that is a regular part of White House life. It, it, if you are working on priorities that are important to the administration, yes. And one would assume that while you're, if you are a staff person in the White House, all of us are working on priorities that are important to the President. Not going to meetings at that level are not necessarily a daily occurrence of sure. your Sure. No, I realize that is a rare one. Okay. But we can all agree, I believe, I think the ranking member would join with me, that the signature piece of legislation of the President is the Affordable Care Act. Can you figure out for me or help me understand how people could serve the President so poorly that it appears he was never told that this was going to be a disastrous launch? So in my analysis from the public record, as well as watching the testimony that happened prior, um, I believe that if I were in that position, that I would have elevated things through because that is this President's key legislation. It is his number one priority. And so that is what the Chief Information Officer is supposed to do. They are supposed to analyze, as I said in my testimony, analyze what potential decisions are being made and what is that impact on the President's priorities to get done from a political perspective, from a communications perspective, from an oversight perspective of what the impact would be and how you would have to do congressional notification if you were changing things. And that is what a CIO is supposed to do. That would have been elevated up so that the OMB director would have known what the impact was happening so that the director could then talk to the president about potential opportunities. Now, Mr. Van Roko was your successor, is yes. that correct? And yet he said that he was only the facilitator of these meetings. Did you do a lot of facilitation when you had his job? And if so, I would call it facilitation. I don't know that the agencies that I was supposed to provide leadership and oversight to would necessarily call it facilitation. I would like to think that that's the nice way that we did it. Um, but I did. But you, you invited people to yes. be in groups. You brought them to the White House or accompanying facilities, yes. and at those, those meetings, you either were there personally 
or at least you introduced the meeting and monitored whether it was going the direction that you and your bosses wanted it to go? So I can speak to my own management style, which is um, a very hands-on approach, because if my, I really personally view that if it is my boss's priority, number one priority, to get something done, then it is my job to make sure that the leadership up the chain to him are fully informed of decisions that are being made. So I am a little hands-on as a manager. Um, I came up through the ranks, through operations, so I have a tendency to do that. Um, but you are not a micromanager. I, I would like to think I am not. But if it is something that is that important, um, I would, I personally, especially things that were important to the uh, administration at the time during my tenure, I would personally make sure that I knew the status of what was going on on those pro projects. Well, Mr. Spires, I am not leaving you out completely, but I will ask both of you, in 184 weeks from the passage of the Affordable Care Act until the failure to launch, can you conceive that anyone leaving GAO out on that first panel, should not have seen that there were problems and had taken at least an active role in addressing those problems? Proper governance, Proper governance is critical on programs like this, because there, there are a lot of stakeholders involved, and you need to have good information, and you need to do it on a very regular basis to make sure that these programs are going well. Um, Individuals at this panel, uh, other than Mr. Pounder, certainly I think should have been in that chain of receiving that information, reviewing that, being part of reviews as part of a good governance model that clearly did not exist. Uh, Ms. Evans, I'll, I'll, I'll modify that as my, my close. Not only shouldn't they have, but can you give us a little bit of a feel for what thing life would have been like if President Bush, who you worked for, had gotten blindsided by a failure of one of his hallmark pieces of legislation, Medicare Part D, of the No Child Left Behind or something of, of a similar level? So I was involved in Medicare Part D, just so that you know. Um, and I, we could talk about that as well. If, if something like this happened during my tenure, um, I can only speak for what I would do. I would have offered my resignation before I got fired. With that, I recognize the ranking member. And you never got fired. I want to make that point. No, I did not get fired. I did the job for six years. But in this particular case, if my president had to go on TV and say some of the things that um, this current president has had to do in an area of my responsibility, I would have offered my resignation. Thank you. What was your res responsibility with regard to Medicare Part D? Um, so when the rollout came out, um, there was there was some specific issues related to information technology, and and I would say it's the same type of thing that's happening right now, and analysis had to be done about could you actually fix it through information technology. Um, what were the issues? And it really was a timing issue with the legislation, which is the reason why I'm making the point about when you pass a law, you have to know. So the way that that legislation was crafted, if a user signed up for the benefit at 11.59 p.m. on the 30th of the month or the 31st of the month, then they were eligible at 12.01 a.m. the next month for that benefit. There is no IT system, the way that these systems work, that you could get all that information populated through the system. So you had to really analyze what was the work process and how the IT worked. So what we did was we provided options to the policy councils to say, if there really is ad additional funds available, what happened was they had, similar to what the navigators are now, okay, people to help sign up. And if you signed up people uh, before the 15th of the month, then those people actually got paid within 30 days, the ones that were helping sign people up. If you signed up after the 15th of the month, then the people that were helping do this actually would get paid 45 to 60 days later. So the idea was, okay, if the technology solutions can only, there is a big batch process that happens the 15th of the month, you provide the incentives up front, get everybody into the system between the 1st and the 15th get them signed up so that all their data shows up in, in the IT systems by the next month so that they are eligible when they are supposed to do it. So, so but, but let me ask you this. Were there IT problems back then? 
What there you? are always IT problems, but what you have to do is analyze it from a business perspective and provide alternatives to the policy leadership so that they can make informed policy decisions of how they are going to handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I specifically remember uh, working with my constituents uh, because they were having all kinds of problems. Absolutely. Uh, let, me, let me ask you both this. If you have a situation here uh, where, for example, in the governors, uh, more than half the governors decide not, for example, to do their own marketplace. Does that, would that have affected you in any way, or should that have affected this project? I am just curious, as far from an IT standpoint. Well, sure, it, it, sure it would, sir. I mean, you, from a volume standpoint, from the scope and scale of what you would need to create, you know, does it make it a little harder? Could yes, it, it, a little more complicated. A little more complicated, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so, Ms. Spires, uh, some have suggested that one of the problems with the development of the Affordable Care website is that there was no uh, single contractor overseeing the work of all the other contractors, that there was no lead system integrator. However, experience in the past administrations with use of contractors used to oversee other contractors has often resulted in failed programs and billions of wasted tax dollars. Is that right? That is correct. And I have very I have close history with this at the IRS, if you would like me to comment on, on yeah, a particular well, topic. I, mean, I came in in 2004 to run the Business Systems Modernization Program at the IRS and they had moved to that outsourced kind of uh, program management office where a contractor was serving as that, as that systems integrator, and it was not working well. And I am a, I'm a huge believer that the government needs to stand up to build a strong program management office for these large-scale, complex IT programs. You have to have solid, experienced government people in charge and running these programs. doesn't mean you can't have contractor support. Yeah. But I have found if you don't do that, the dynamics don't work. Um, there are so many stakeholders involved that are government people that you have to work with that are not part of the program. And in order to make that work effectively, you need to have strong government people on the ground that are running this program day in and day out. And so, you know, I, I didn't see it in IT, but I saw it uh, when I was uh, chairman of the Coast Guard subcommittee. Uh, uh, with deep water, <laughs> yes. where we were literally buying boats that didn't float. Yes. Literally. Yes. Some of them are sitting in my, dis near my district right now. Um, and the contractor, the lead system integrator, um, didn't have the, that intertwined situation mm -hmm. that you just talked about where the government people were doing their piece and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. So I see my time has expired. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I thank the gentleman, <clears throat> Mr. DeSantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thanks to the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Ch Henry Chow, he told the committee when, when they interviewed him that he had not ever rolled out a program that had complete systems-wide end-to-end testing. And I was just wondering for your take on, on that, to not have system-wide end-to-end testing. Is that a good, good practice? Um, well, it is. That's poor practice at best. Um, I, I I may make another comment about this if I could. I I was as far as what I know, right around the timing, um, the, the the testing clearly was not adequate to 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 put this uh, system into production. And just my experience has always been, and I've had to live this. Okay, where we made these hard calls. Um, it's better to delay, and it's better to delay for two reasons. One. Um, you only get that one chance to make that first impression with the system. And we, we clearly didn't do it well here, did we, with the rollout of healthcare.gov. But, but two, and even more importantly than that, once you put the system in production, you got to operate it, maintain it, deal with all the customer issues and all that. And that in and of itself is a very large amount of work that takes energy from the team rather than the team really getting to the point of fixing the system to the point where it is running well. And then putting it into production. And I know for whatever reason this October 1st date was viewed as immovable, but I think that was a very big mistake made on the rollout of healthcare.gov. I appreciate that. And, and you know, I was looking through some of the, the materials, and in late September, 
uh, there was a memo that, that said that um, the ongoing development opposed a level of uncertainty that can be deemed as a high risk security threat. And so when you see that, I mean, that seems to me that would be a big red light uh, that this is not ready to go forward. Would that be how, how you would, uh, would you concur with that? Based on my experience, yes, sir, I would. Uh, that would be a, a risk that you would have to evaluate the October 1st deadline against what kind of operating risk is there and can you mitigate that risk. And it would have to be fully explained to the leadership involved, in this case the CMS director, and probably further up about what could happen if we went for it with the implementation and we haven't fully tested all of these things. It is frustrating because so much of this law, and we see it in the implementation, was based on representations to the American people that have now uh, turned out not to be true. For example, if you like your plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. It will reduce the budget deficit. Uh, we will we'll cover everybody. The most recent estimate is 10 years from now, you are still going to have 31 million people with no coverage. So this bill doesn't even do that. Um, and as I was looking through some of the, uh, the testimony, some of these regs that the people needed in order to start implementing it were delayed on purpose, on political decision, to get through the 2012 election. So these folks were in a situation where um, they had to kind of create this website, but they actually weren't given as much time as they could have had the administration been forthright about some of these things, but there was a, a, a desire to move this beyond the 2012 election so that the American people would not be able to fully evaluate the program. And so what I have just seen here today is that there was a decision uh, by the administration, a knowing decision, to launch a website that, that did not work and indeed was not adequately tested uh, for security. And I think this is problematic just generally, no matter what you are doing from a government IT perspective. But this website is unique because individual Americans, and we have millions of people now who are seeing their, uh, their insurance plans canceled because of this law. Uh, it is not like that website is just out there for them. They are forced to get, under penalty of law, health coverage through that website if they are one of the unfortunate folks who have seen their plans canceled. And so we are in a situation where the government is going to tax them unless they procure insurance off this website that is not fully functioning and that has uh, questions about uh, its security. And so, so it is very, very discouraging. I know I have a lot of, lot of constituents uh, who, who are upset about this. So uh, I just appreciate you guys coming. I think that this is, um, uh, in terms of a, a case study on how not to do something, uh, I think people will look back on this. But I think one of the things was there were political imperatives here and the politics trumped what would work and what would be best for the American people. And I think that is unfortunate. And I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. I would like to ask just a couple more questions. I see no one else here. Uh, when both of you served uh, the previous administration, did they ever tell you what the cost of not launching uh, one of your projects was? Did you ever actually, like, the, in the private sector, it is like, you know, we are going to have X amount of revenue every month, and if we don't, if we don't launch Windows XP, then we lose that much revenue. Did you ever have those discussions as part of your daily work? We would, sir, the IRS uh, have discussions about um, if, for example, a new audit thing. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, to there was we there, there were business models that were built for systems that would show the kind of return, and of course, at the IRS, you could actually measure it many times in dollars. So yes, well, we did have those kinds of discussions. Well, I'm going to. How about you? Mr. Well, and I was going to say we would have those discussions across the board on each and every agency's performance. So when agencies turn in uh, a business case to justify the investment, they also put in there the return or the cost-benefit analysis. So if you delay the launch date, then it affects your ability to start re-getting re some of the benefits. Because the benefits in the government are, when you measure them, is a little bit different than the bottom line in private industry. So it is benefits to the taxpayer for the services that could be delayed with a, uh, a delayed launch. Well, in this case, that doesn't happen to be true. This is like a private business, and I'll show you here. And I wish Mr. Van Roko was still here. The estimate from CBO at the time of, uh, of uh, in, in, well, they keep changing it, but in February of this year, 
the estimate was that uh, penalties from uninsured individuals were going to total $52 billion over a decade, half a billion dollars a year. And uh, although that number keeps shrinking of what they think they are going to get, uh, similarly, the penalties from employers, $150 billion over 10 years, more or less $100 million a month. So here is this website, and Mr. Cummings and I have heard the figure $600 million enough times that it, it, it we echoes in our sleep. But the delay of Obamacare from a standpoint of revenue, when the President had to delay the employer mandate, he was losing $100 million a month of revenue. If he had had to delay uh, the uh, no, I am sorry, I got my figure wrong. I have to be a little careful on that part. Uh, 50, 40, 45 billion over 10 years is 4.5 billion a year, so uh, it's about 250 million. Uh, well, it, back in February, it was 300 million a month would have been lost if he delayed the penalties on the uninsured individuals. But he'd already delayed something that was three times larger. So the reason I'm asking this is, <clears throat> Ms. Evans, if you were back at OMB and somebody had told you in a timely fashion, we're in trouble on this website, and we need to delay this thing because our projections two months or three months out, it is not going to be ready. And you were looking at having to go to the President and say, we would like you to delay something that will delay revenue by $300 million a month. Wouldn't you have had a normal business decision of, well, can't we spend $300 million more if that is what it takes to get this thing done on time? I mean, in a sense, again, I go back to what I said before Mr. Cummings was there. The President was so poorly served in that I assume, and Mr. Spires, your experience particularly would be helpful here, I assume that if, you, if six months earlier you said, you know, in order to not lose $300 million a month of revenue, calculated revenue, we need to put more money into this, we wouldn't be talking half a billion or a billion or $2 billion. We would be talking incrementally a relatively small amount of money to do a project necessary to get this thing locked in and tested in a timely fashion, wouldn't we? If I could comment, I and I'm thinking that somebody. No, I, I appreciate you your earlier. point. Um, I I don't. I would even say this. I'm not even sure this was about money. I'm not sure you would have had to add more people to this. If you had identified I, I don't issues, think you would have. I just wanted I, to make the point was, that there was plenty of money at stake. Well, there might have been, but I, I, I go back to the point of the program management disciplines. Now, to that end, once you get close, I mean, once you're six months in, and it's very, very hard to then change, right, and, and you're not going to pick up a lot of, a, a lot of time. Um, but if this had been done correctly on the program management side, I, I suspect that the money was there. I, I don't think that was a constraint on this particular program. Ms. Evans? So given the scenario that you just outlined, the way that this would be presented during my tenure, the way we would present it is these, these are tradeoffs that are policy decisions that need to have tradeoffs. And so you would analyze this is the income that was going to come in. This is the method that we thought we were going to be able to do. But given where it is, here are the alternatives, and then here are the trade-offs so that you can either realize a portion of that or, you know, we can then recover it and then some if we go with this. And so alternatives would have vetted through the policy process so that people could have looked at that and then said, okay, well, you know, we can't put so many people on it. There is a point of diminishing returns. There is only so much dollars and so many people that you can throw at an IT project in order to fix it. So then you would have alternatives in order to realize that income so that the, you could move forward to reduce the deficit. And that is part of the analysis that the Office of Management and Budget would lend to the policy process so that the decisions could be made by the appropriate policy. Officials. Let me just close with a question. If we went back three and a half years and upon the passage, the regulations necessary to determine some of the specifics the software would have to deal with had been done in a timely fashion, six months or so, then presented to industry and stakeholders and going through a process of, if you will, analyzing it from a standpoint of, of the needs of those who would use it then taking the outcome of that, producing a standard a year, year and a half into this process, delivering that to the contractor, and then monitoring the process of a fixed and final set of regulations relative to this, the website and its work, 
is there any doubt in your mind that three and a half years was in any way, shape, or form not enough time to start with the passage in, in, of the Affordable Care Act three and a half years ago and reach a well-tested, well-engineered, from a security, speed, scalability on the launch date of October 1st? In other words, was there anything inherently wrong with picking October 1st that good practices over three and a half years wouldn't have taken care of? I, I think with where they are at, and um, I mean, it is a little hard to know how, how long it will take for this to really stabilize, but it will stabilize. Uh, so if you look at it from that perspective, sir, I am pretty sure that if this had been well managed, and your point, include the regulation process of that, um, that this site could have been delivered um, w in a, in appropriate on October 1st, and it could have been well running on that date. I would look at it, uh, and I always look at things from my tenure at OMB. That we there was a long tenure, and it was a long tenure, and uh, and and also from an operational perspective coming up. But I would have looked at the law to understand what were we really required to do by what time period, and really scoped the project to a point where it was very clear and understood what was going to be delivered. I think one of the major issues that you have here with the requirements that happen on every IT project is, is that there is scope creep. So as people start working through it, they add on another requirement and they add on another requirement. So the, you should, the parameters have to be drawn on something that is this complex so that everyone would have a clear understanding of what is really going to launch on October 1st, if that is the President's due date, and then stick to that and everything else becomes an add-on and a module. And that is good best business practice. And if it is critical that you have to have it, then it has to be voted on through the good governance process, through a business process. And uh, that is the part that is still a little unclear in this overall process of what really was the scope and what was expected to be delivered on October 1st. Thank you. And that's, that is what we are going to continue working on, regardless of uh, uh, the actual Affordable Care Act, but the question of what went wrong and how do we prevent it in the future. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ms. Uh, Evans, you know, I was listening to you very carefully, and uh, thank you. And you said that um, if you were in the situation where your boss had to go before the American people and do what President Obama did. I am not trying to put words in your mouth. You said you probably would resign. Is that right? Yes. And, you know, we, there are two parts to this. <clears throat> One part is what happened in the past. The other part is where we go in the future. I think it is very important that we learn from the past. I believe that it can tell us a lot about um, mistakes we made so that we don't fall into those ditches again. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is where I want to go. I, 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 I say to my staff, there are two things that I am most concerned about, effectiveness and efficiency. I tell them we have a limited amount of time on this earth, and we have a limited amount of time to be in the positions that we are in, that is our watch, and we must do what we have to do for the American people in an effective and efficient way. Now, I guess my question is, where so suppose your, your President Bush, say for he was in these circumstances, and he said, Evans, don't quit. Fix it. Mm -hmm. What would you do? And do you believe it could be fixed in a reasonable amount of time? If at all. Okay. So if so, you didn't quit. I so I didn't quit. Not wouldn't let you quit. You didn't let me quit because <laughs> I had to fix my mistake. So at this point, I would be down in the daily operations. I would have done a, an assessment to see what exactly could be fixed, and then again back to the scoping issue of what the president actually said would be available and what is now required. Now, you have additional circumstances on here with the insurance companies canceling, 
policies, and you have this gap now where people actually have to be able to sign up for services. So that would be analyzed in this, and I would say, okay, here is where we are with the IT project. We need to put other kinds of compensating controls in place in order to be able to deal with the American public's need to be able to sign up for insurance. And that would be then elevated through the policy chain. So things like going directly to insurance providers, putting up, as Chairman Issa said, the, the whole list of what plans are that are available so that people could at least see the information and not necessarily sign up. All those alternatives would be laid out, and they would be viewed from a communications perspective, from a policy perspective, and from a political perspective to ensure that you could put the best service forward to meet that immediate need of that gap between the December 15th and the January 1st deadline, because that is the big critical piece that you are trying to get to right now. And how do you fix that and how do you meet that need for the American people? Mr. Mr. Spires, did you have a response to my same question? Uh, well, let me add on. I mean, would you, would you add, yeah, do you have something to add to what you said? Uh, well, let me, let me just add that I, I applaud uh, and, I, and I, I want to thank the team that is working on this. And, you know, I mean, we talked about Mr. Park and what he is doing, but my goodness, the whole team has got to be working around the clock to try well, to you, are you in, Are you familiar with the team other than Mr. Park? No, I am. Are you familiar with Mr. Park? Yes, I am. Right. And yes. what is your opinion of him he's, and his competence? He is a very talented technologist, extremely talented. And they tell me he is one of the best in the world. I think that is probably a fair, a fair assessment, sir. All right, go ahead. Um, let, let me add a couple things, though, about this November, the, the end of November. And, I, and, and look, I would like it to work, too. I mean, I'm, this is all for me about helping government make IT more effective. But this end of November, there's, there's two concerns I have, right? One is it, it's just very difficult when you're in this. Um, it, when you do integration testing, and that's essentially what we're still doing, even though the system is alive, you tend to find, for a while, you tend to find defects actually increase as you do more testing, as you, as you, and even as you work things off and fix things, you even get more. And so I'm worried about that. The other thing I'm worried about, frankly, is when you do this integration testing, a lot of times you will uncover some significant architectural issues. You may not, but sometimes you do when you integrate these subsystems. And you know where those, where those architectural issues usually show themselves are on performance issues. And so I'm concerned that we're seeing, you know, when they open it up and it doesn't perform well from the you know, scalability standpoint and handling the volume, that's an indication of some potentially underlying technical issues mm -hmm. from an architecture perspective. And those things may take longer to fix. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is just my experience in working these kinds of problems in the past. So when they say they are going to have it fixed by November for the vast majority of, of users, I, 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 think, I hope that is the case. I have just got concerns that that may not turn out to be the case. I think that Mr. Park answered that question several times. Yes. And he talked about, and I think it is probably because of the things that you just talked about. He yes. said, that I can almost repeat it. He says so many times that they have a goal. They have a goal. And right. they are going to try to attain that yeah, goal. Absolutely. But you said something a few minutes ago. You said that, and take, and I am going to put words in your mouth, you yeah. said something to the effect that eventually they will get it together. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they will. Yeah. And, and my last comment is this. You know, I, I guess, says the uh, as, as the son of two former sharecroppers sitting in the Congress after, in, after one generation, um, and a father who only had a second grade education, my father believed in a can-do attitude. Mm -hmm. Can-do. Mm -hmm. That is what this country is all about. And I guess, you know, when I hear all the nations, I am so glad to say, hear you say, that you believe that it will be worked out. You don't know when. I understand that. Mm -hmm. but, but some kind of way, we got to move to that can do. Yes. This is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. I think it would be an embarrassment if we can't get this done. Would you agree? I mean, as IT people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we are the nation that innovates and creates technology. So, you know, it will get fixed. 
This is really a communications issue and an expectation of what are the services that are actually going to be there. We, we had the technology to fix it, and you have some of the smartest people, I am sure, working on it right now, because technology is not a partisan issue. What really needs to be debated overall is some of the other issues that you brought out and what you are talking about is, is the policy issues. And that is where the President should be debating with you, Congress, on policy issues. Technology should be implemented to support that. But, but I think it is also important to say that the way we manage our IT programs in government needs to improve. Yeah. That is a nonpartisan view. That's I, a saw it, yeah. I saw it in the last administration, and I yeah. see it in this administration. I see. Okay? agree. We but, need to fix that. But thank you both. Your testimony has been extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I thank, I thank the ranking uh, member for his comments, and I thank each of you for coming today to testify. I, I do want to follow up a little bit uh, with, because with this additional testing, and as we start to go, and, and having been someone who was in the private sector who has worked a number of times with systems, just when you think you have the, the problem fixed, you find 10 more. Uh, and so with best, best practices, do you not think it is best practice to take down the site while we work through these technical glitches and, and more importantly, through some of the security concerns, which are uh, a bigger problem for me than whether we can get on and log on. It's once you've done that, uh, well, would that me, not be the best practice let, let, to take let, it down? Yes, sir. Let me caveat it by saying this is a nonpolitical statement I made. I understand. Uh, just from a best yeah. practices perspective, if I was running that program and no other considerations, I would immediately take the site down. I would have the team focus on working through the issues. I would, I would do real stress testing on the system, and then I would bring the site back up when it was ready. That is what I would do from a best and practice for sec. That isn't taking into account the of, of all the politics of it, all the politics and we did why that, it needs to stay up or any of that. But from a best practices standpoint. That is because that would be it, it could get the team focused on fixing the system and not operating the system okay. right now. Yes. All right. Ms. Evans, I want to go uh, to some of your testimony, because I, and let me quote here, because I want to understand what you said, the functionality and shortcomings of healthcare.gov are a result of bad management decisions made by policy officials within the administration. They did this, quote, to themselves. And if they are now surprised, uh, is it because their own policy officials failed to inform them of the decisions uh, and the consequences associated with those decisions? We asked that in the earlier panel, and we really didn't get a response. But in light of your testimony, uh, you know, what, did, what did you mean by that? So, for example, a decision that was made to remove the browsing function. Okay, when you make that decision, and what came out in, in the previous panel was that was actually made by um, the project manager based on a technical result of testing. So by that type of decision and rolling that up, there is policy implications associated with that. And so the policy officials said, okay, it is okay. So you, if you take a sequence of events that are programmed into a system that are supposed to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you take out number 2, and now you expect 1, 3, 4, and 5 to work really well and 2 is not there anymore, right. um, that's a po that was a policy decision right. to go forward with a site with a major piece of functionality pulled out and not tested. And that is why I made the statement about, and now you are surprised that it is not working. Or the other part. So they shouldn't be surprised. They should not be surprised. If the sequence is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and right. you take 2 out, and, and you, you have haven't tested the impact of when 2 is out, you should not be surprised it doesn't work. All right. Well, then, uh, so let me ask you this then. Uh, what who should have informed the White House, or what policy official should have done that in this overall healthcare.gov? Who is, who is the go-to person? That's what we've been trying to figure out. Who is the go-to person that said, "Golly, we, we pulled it out, but it's not." Okay. Working. So in the rest of my testimony, and this is not a partisan statement either. This is my belief of what the role of a chief information officer is supposed to do. Right. In my view. What would happen is that would have come up from CMS, so it was made as a technical decision. And the chief information officer 
at a department level is supposed to analyze what that impact is on the portfolio overall on right. behalf of the Secretary. What is that going to mean from both a policy, political, communications, technology, all of that, and then elevate that issue. So I really believe that the Chief Information Officer is the one who is supposed to be the nexus, the tech-savvy person on that staff to analyze those implications as it relates to business and policy. And so I know we have got a lot of CIOs. So who specifically would that have been? I mean, who's, what's the name? Well, in this particular case, if everything worked the way that it's supposed to, um, it would it would have been um, the chief information officer at HHS, because this which is who? Uh, That's Mr. Bateman. Mr. Bateman. Mr. Bateman. Which is in his portfolio. Can can, can I add though? Because I, I think that's absolutely right what you said. But what I like to do in programs is pull those people together on a regular basis in some kind of governance forum, so that you can have those dialogues. So the CIO can represent the technology issues and implications to policy changes. But it shouldn't just be the CIO's decision. No, and it's you're not. not and I'm not saying it's it should be. It decision. should be a shared decision. Shared decision, but he should be the one informing. That's correct. That's right. Okay. Yes. All right. So I'll finish with this last question. And I, I have Google in my district. I love Google. <laughs> uh, we have in California, of which I don't represent, we have unbelievable expertise. Because we are the greatest nation, as the ranking member talked about, would we not be reaching out to those experts right now and saying, you know, please come help us get it all done? Would that not be the appropriate thing to do? Uh, to I, th I, th I thought, sir, that they brought in a few, a a few, few technical but, experts you know, as well. Um, but really, if we're trying, uh, if we're trying to get this done by November 30th which I think a lot of us question whether it will really happen, and, and that should not be necessarily an indictment. Would we not reach out to more experts in the private sector field? Well, I, I think at this point it's, that, that would not work for November 30th. Um, it, the learning curve, I mean, any it's system too great. is so great. Okay. I mean, you'd spend more time trying to get these experts up to speed on the specifics of the details of healthcare.gov than you would get any benefit out of that uh, in, at this point. I, that doesn't mean going forward. Uh, you, you might not want to engage others as well. Well, the one thing that I would want to add, because I think both Richard and I have been in situations with challenged rollouts in our career, mm -hmm. where we have had challenged rollouts. And to your point, the best value that uh, Silicon Valley could do at this point is validate the solutions you are going to put in place. So what I have done in the past on projects where I have had, and I have had failures in my career, um, as my technical team is telling me that this is what we are going to do or these are the changes that we are going to make, um, we would validate those against and, and talk to Silicon Valley saying from a technical perspective. So they are only analyzing the technical issues at that point saying if we roll this out and this is the current problem and we make these configuration changes, is that going to solve the problem? And that is probably the best application of those resources at that point and as well with healthcare.gov. I thank the chairman. I thank you. And, you know, if this were health care and not IT, we probably would say get a second medical opinion in this case. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Again, I want to thank you all. I just, um, you know, I just, I think, you know, when we talk about best practices, um, you know, it's, uh, you look at, I wish, maybe in this instance that some of these best practices that we are talking about have been done. Um, and I noticed that you all talked about um, IT, technical, and then you also talked about a little bit, a little bit about political. Mm -hmm. And so there is so much that goes into these, um, these decisions. But, the, 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 but for me, I want to see, see this work, and I am sure you do too. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I do not, I just don't believe in failure. We're better than that. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that the folks who were a part of the process um, will, you know, hear the things that you are talking about. Um, because I think our strength is 
in the expertise we all bring. All of us have our own experiences, and having served in the positions that you served and serve, uh, you bring a lot to the table. And hopefully, folks will have their ears open and their minds open to make sure that this doesn't happen this, you know, this way again. Uh, we, we, I just think we can do better. I know we can do better. And I guess the bottom line is that there are so many people that are depending on us. Yes. Yes. There are a lot yeah. of people. I, I'm not calling this a failure, sir. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's troubled, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But this, this is not a failure, and we need to get it fixed. You're right. And if I could just also say, because I think it's important enough to say, and I made this comment, but I think it's important. We need the CIOs to be strengthened in this government from the standpoint of their empowerment. Um, so you are familiar with um, Mr. Oh, Ice's bill? Absolutely. And I've, Chairman, I, I, I very much support that. Yeah. Um, Do you they, think that, that legislation well, when you have the lineup gets you where you are trying to get to? Yeah, the lineup of CIOs that you on your first panel, and, and none of them were, you know, uh, were really engaged. Mm -hmm. That is just not correct. Yeah. And, and it leads to failure on yeah. vitae programs. And what were you saying? Yeah. Well, my view is, is that the legislation should pass. I have had a lot of discussions with Chairman Nice's staff about this and the role of the CIO, because I obviously feel very passionate about it. Um, I believe if that law is passed, it will remove all excuses for non-performance of CIOs, and you would have a very different oversight meeting. Because everything that CIOs mm -hmm. have said in the past that they cannot do that legislation would fix, and therefore they would be held accountable for their job. And by the way, that is something that we did on, on a bipartisan basis. That is right. Yes. But thank you very much. I really appreciate both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I have got just one closing question. Now, I know that you are not software writers per se, uh, but I, I talked to uh, Mr. Ferenthal, who actually put up websites, and I just asked a question. You saw in the last panel where I essentially admonished uh, all of them to look at the uh, 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 FEHBP mm -hmm. for what was just, for 230 plans, what was just a few pages that would tell you how much each plan was and how much the government would pay and how much each person would pay. Now, one of the reasons that that was only a few pages is that uh, that spreadsheet was for a program that did not age discriminate. The Affordable Care Act discriminates based on three things. The plan itself, if it is regional, has a region in which it operates. If it is national, it has a single price, like FEHBP. It discriminates based on age and whether you smoke or not. I have gone back and forth. Those are the only variables. Mm -hmm. So for a given location, which is where you choose your plan, let's just say the Alabama something or other, uh, you only have to know your age and whether you smoke or not. And I did a little quick math, uh, and again, unlike the gentleman from Harvard, Mr. Park or Mr. Massey from uh, uh, MIT, I went to Kent State and a little Catholic school up in Michigan, so I, I did arithmetic, not calculus. But between 65 and 27, when you leave your parents' plan and the time you are eligible for Medicare, there's 38 years. So as far as I could tell, there were 38 different ages you could be based on the cost on a given plan. And then the question of do you smoke or not. So I saw essentially a spreadsheet or a database to retrieve from of 76 possible answers mm -hmm. if you want to go to a plan and ask how much it cost. Now, for both of you, if I wanted a website that had an engine in the back end that looked at for a given plan, and asked the question of how old are you and do you smoke or not, and then I went out and got the number from that cell, how hard do you think that would be? Because you understand on September 12th, or September 3rd, they made a decision to not launch that part. September 12th, they reiterated it. They scrubbed moving the software. They moved their people to other problems. I just want to understand, how many people and how long do you think it would take for 76 different numbers that you put in on a little program, uh, here is my age and I smoke or I don't smoke and I want to know how much this plan is. And I am being a little facetious, and Mr. Spires, you are uh, both smiling well, but, but that really is the website that we are asking for, for a, a splash type open shopping. Please. Well, 
obviously, with the requirements you stated, that is a pretty simple website. I suspect that what Mr. Chow was referring to had a lot more functionality and capabilities, and you can call them bells and whistles and maybe inappropriate than that. But, did, but didn't the American people deserve to be able to surf prices as simple as a database? It is almost the back end of a pocket calculator to come up with that. Well, absolutely. And, but again, when you get into some of the big projects, and that is what I meant about scope creep and really understanding what really did have to launch on October 1st based on that policy decision. So if it is as simple as what you described, um, the government already has uh, a website set up called Benefits.gov that those simple questions, and this might be an alternative that they could use right now while they are working on the longer plan, those simple questions could be put in there. Uh, you can fill out this information now. Um, this was started as one of the 24 initiatives, and you would not only find out out what you are eligible for under healthcare.gov, but you could also find out what other Federal benefits you are available for based on the way that you would answer these questions that only live in the session. So that whole site was set up for Federal benefits so that you could see everything that you would be avail that you are eligible for as a citizen. So that simple requirement could have launched and can still launch in benefits.gov. Well, you know, I am of an age that uh that I knew the names of all the Mercury astronauts. And uh, I didn't know much about government contracting as a young man, but I have been told that the space pen was designed to be able to write in zero gravity so they could make their notes in this inverted zero gravity. But the Russians used a pencil. And that <laughs> the pencil cost what it took to sharpen it, well, the space pen cost millions of dollars to design and produce. Now, that may be a, a euphemism for a lot of what we deal with, but today we heard somebody tell us that they decided to scrub because there were security concerns over what ultimately was a glorified splash page. If you were back, both of you were back in your positions, and you wanted to please your boss by giving him as much deliverable as you could, mm -hmm. and 30 days out you discovered that you, something had to give, would you have grabbed a pencil out of the drawer? instead of telling people that they would have to wait months or years to get the space pen? I certainly would have tried that, sir. And I would have even said, it seems to me, and I will echo uh, what it, Ms. Evans said, that there, there should have been a lot of work up front to simplify as much as possible what needed to be launched on October 1st. I want to thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lacey Clay, alluded to the Harris project uh, that was done <clears throat> during previous administration where the Census Bureau, not really administration, mm -hmm. had 10 years to launch something and they kept changing it so that the corporation could legitimately say that it wasn't ready, but they could show all these change orders in what was basically a handheld scanner, uh, not a terribly highfalutin piece of technology. So I, I do understand the mission creep. Uh, we were just told that apparently in the month of October we signed up approximately 27,000 people into Obamacare. With that, would either one of you like to venture whether or not the estimate we were given that they are now signing up roughly 27,000 an hour, the Federal Exchange, but we were told they are signing up about 27,000 an hour. So apparently they are signing up about the same amount per hour that they signed up in the first month. Do any of you venture a guess to what that number will be? Will it be at least 10 times 27,000 an hour or 270,000 a day uh, at the end of the month? Or are you going to bet on the low side? I am not a betting person, so I will put that on the record. I mean, there is not enough information for yeah. me to bet. Okay, but, I, 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 but with 17000 an hour being <laughs> yeah. told to us under oath here today, does anyone want to look at 170000 or 200000 or 300000 a day and bet higher or lower here? Lower. It is going to be lower because he said 17000 registrations. So that is not 17000 completions. This is, again, a, a, a you know, uh, you are talking about some, what, how they are measuring certain things and how you want the outcomes. So you are looking at the outcomes and they are measuring things at the beginning of the process. So if you are talking about all the way through the process, it is going to be on the lower side. I suspect you are exactly right. I, I, you know, when I was in private life, they, uh, 
they always wanted to sell me uh, Im impressions, how many impressions a piece of advertising got, mm -hmm. and I always wanted to buy how many sales. Yeah. Right. So I suspect that we have 17,000 impressions an hour. Well, in fact, the amount of sales could be not much more than that, less than 30,000. Uh, so I'm, I'm betting that when we get our answer at the end of November uh, that it's 100,000 or less uh, to the Federal Exchange. And I certainly hope for more because we need it to be, I think, 43,000 a day if we're going to cover everyone. Would either of you like to make any closing statements? I just want to I appreciate you guys inviting me back, the committee inviting me back to share my viewpoints. And I would echo some of the, the comments that Richard has made today with that it is important to get that legislation through to enhance the roles of the CIO so that you can ensure that other things like IT procurement and those things happen so that we can avoid this for this, this type of project for all of the whole entire portfolio. I, um I'm not sure I could say it any better than you just said it, Karen. So I, I have no other remarks. Thank you. I thank you both. We always say I'll associate myself with the gentlelady. <laughs> so I thank you both again for your public service in the past and your continued service today. We stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.